Turn to the book of Psalms. We're in Psalm 21. It's been quite a ride. And uh, loving the fact that we're in this book, studying the Psalms, especially when we find ourselves in seasons of challenge and difficulty and trouble. And um, the book of Psalms prepares us for those things, teaches us how to pray. If you need a copy of God's Word, the ushers would be uh, delighted to assist you just flag them down as they walk by uh, your row. We're going to give attention here to Psalm 21, uh, and then next week we'll be in Psalm 22, uh, which is the perfect psalm for communion. We'll uh, celebrate communion together and look at a lot of the prophecy that is fulfilled from the cross uh, where Psalm 22 is concerned. And then, drum roll please, where is Psalm 23, <laughs> Psalm 23, my absolute favorite. Um, Lord just speaks so clearly through Psalm 23, and, and uh, we will be in no rush to get through that one whatsoever. I'm thinking about a four-week series <laughs> in Psalm 23, um, and that'll take us right up to Palm Sunday. So uh, be praying for that. That's kind of where we're headed, and it gives you a little bit of a flight plan of where we're headed together. Um, We were here till after 9 o'clock last night, just thinking and praying and fellowshipping together. The Saturday night service is uh, just an incredible time, and then Steve went off to a hospital visitation. I went home to take care of my wife. Hey, thank you for your prayers. She's home from the hospital, and... um, Sends, sends her love to you all. She's uh, recovering, and uh, we're getting there together. There is nothing like your wife in the hospital uh, and a Russian invasion that sort of brings some perspective to life, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, so uh, we'll do that together. I, I really uh, am encouraged and excited to see. And no more flowers, please. My house looks like a funeral home. Um, you guys are amazing. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I'd be 600 pounds if I ate all the food that's showing up at the house. She's doing, she's doing great. It's going to take a while because the appendix burst. Uh, so, you know, fighting off the infection and everything, and then some kidney stones, and then, you know, some other stuff. So, uh, we're kind of in the midst of it, but so are you, and Psalms is for us uh, in seasons like this. Where do you turn? Uh, Who do you put your trust in? Um, When you're beginning to wonder what makes sense, and... um, I heard someone say, where did the wisdom go that was lost in all the knowledge? And where did the knowledge go in the midst of all the information? Like There is no lack of information. There's really no lack of knowledge, but there is a huge void of wisdom. And so together we, uh, we come and we turn and we give attention and, and, uh, and we seek God's face. And he reveals himself and his love to us um, in the most beautiful way through the Psalms. So I hope you're enjoying them. I hope you're soaking them in. We have a beautiful one set for us. Uh, this morning, really the other side of the coin where Psalm 20 is concerned, and uh, a lot of the prayer that is made uh, with David's request, we found nine of them last time, nine nuggets of prayer in Psalm 20 are, are really now fulfilled and answered in, in Psalm 21. You ready? You geared up? Ready to go? Look what it says. The king, now he's going to speak in third person, sort of like my grandson Bo. He's like, Bo, watch show? Bo have a snack, Bo ride the tractor. So here's David uh, pulling the third person approach uh, in, in the psalm here. He says, the king, speaking of himself, the king shall have joy in your strength. Not in his own strength, not in his own position, not in his own accomplishments, 
No, even the king, a lot of accoutrements that come along with being the king. No, the king will have joy in your strength, O Lord, in your salvation. How greatly shall he rejoice. You have given him his heart's desire. Have not withheld the request of his lips. So he's made all these prayer requests. And the Lord has answered. The Lord has seen fit to show himself strong on David's behalf. You have not withheld the the, the request of his lips. For you meet him, look at this, with the blessings of goodness. And you set a crown of pure gold upon his head. He's talking messianically now. He's prophetically speaking of something much greater and grander than the simple simple crown or wreath that Paul says. We're not just running for this wreath and prize and, 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 and victory here, but one that is eternal that is waiting for us. He's like, that's the crown. He crowns me with the pure gold. And, 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 and he asks life from you, and, and, and you gave it to him. And, and not just 60 years or 70. If you shop at Jimbo's, like, like long life, like forever life, you gave it to him length of days forever and ever. His glory is great in your salvation. His glory isn't great in himself. His glory isn't great in his own accomplishments. His, Glory is great in the Lord. He's bringing us back to to an alignment and perspective that allows the Lord to be the center of it all. His glory is great in you. His glory is great in your salvation. Honor and majesty you have placed upon him for you made him most blessed forever. What a line. What a what a, what a great thought. What an, what an encouragement we gather together and, 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 and worship him for all that he has done, both for David and, 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 and for us. You have made him most blessed forever. Don't let the enemy rob your joy, church. Don't lose the wonder of all that the Lord has done, is doing, and will be faithful to complete and perfect in us. You have made him most blessed forever. You made him exceedingly glad with your presence. Church, he has enemies at the door. He's got all sorts of antagonism that is surrounding him. And, and, and yet, look, look where he goes. Look, look at his heart. You have, you've made him exceedingly glad. Don't let the enemy rob your joy. For the king, here's David, trusts in the Lord. And through the mercy of the Most High, he shall not be moved. Don't let this run you into a ditch. Don't get off course with all that's happening right now. He, I will not be moved. This is, it reminds me of Moses' word to Joshua, right? Be strong, he says. Be strong and courageous. In in fact, it says this, be strong and of good courage. In other words, there's a couple of different courages to choose from. He's like, choose the good one. Be strong and of, of, of good courage, you see. And here David is describing exactly that, the best of all. Doesn't mean the trouble's over. Trouble's surrounding David at this particular season and time in his life and yet he shows us where to go in the midst of trouble and he says i i will not be moved from this and and then and then declares this again in a very messianic powerful prophetic way that yahweh ultimately in the end wins all of these skirmishes and wars and 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 battles and and uh, and defeats our foes he says in verse eight your hand will find all of your enemies Your right hand will find those who hate you. And you shall make them as a fiery oven in the time of your anger. And the Lord will swallow them up in his wrath. And the fire will devour them. 
Just a little news alert of what's to come. You want to make sure you're on Team Jesus right now. Had a friend that sent me a quote online that said, um, you have a comedian who's become a great leader in the midst of other leaders becoming clowns. <laughs> what a day we're living in. And ultimately here David reminds us in actually fast forwarding the whole thing down to the valley of Armageddon and says the Lord is going to swallow them all up in his wrath and the fire will devour them and their offspring you will destroy from the earth and their descendants from among the sons of men. Meanwhile, they're like knocking on David's door, the enemy is. And here's David in the calmness of the peace and rest that is found in the assurances of the Psalms that he wrote when he was out in the pasture with the sheep. God's got this. He continues to go to the Lord with it all and says in verse 11, For they intended evil against you. Those are the words of Joseph, right? When he even declares to his brother what the enemy intended for evil. God's turned around and used it for good. They intended evil against you. They devised a plot which they are not able to perform. Therefore, you'll make them turn their back. and You, you will make them ready. You, you, you will make your arrows ready on, on your string toward their face. Be exalted, O Lord. Be, be exalted. Look at verse 13. Declare this with me. Come on, let's read it together. You want to read it? Let's read it together. Come on. Be exalted, O Lord, in your own strength. We will sing and praise your power. Man, what a song. And the wonder of it all. The word that really pops off the page for me is wonder. The wonder of it all. And, 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 and for some of us, you know, what, what, what David is focusing on here is wonder. The, the wonder of the goodness of God, the, the wonder of his faithfulness, the wonder. But maybe for you, wonder has a question mark behind it. I don't know, I'm going to wonder. It's time for the question mark to be replaced with an exclamation point. That's what David does in Psalm 21. It's like, wow, look at the wonder. That's what Psalm 19 was all about, right? Were you here for that? Psalm 19 was like, wow, the wonder of all of the universe declaring the glory of God. And then Psalm 20, even in the nine requests of prayer that he makes, he doesn't lose his wonder. Church, you can't lose the wonder of it all. Don't lose the wonder of it all. Allow the wonder to have an exclamation point attached to it. That you are secure in the Lord and in his love for you. And I think ultimately David just helps us sum up what we should be fixated upon in, in days and seasons and, and weeks like this. And who knows what the eyes of March are going to have in store. They've gone like active on the nuclear things, you know, in the last 24 hours. Hello. I think he sums up what we should all be living for and it's simply three things faith hope and love that's it that's all that's enough because that's all that remains faith what is your faith in right now faith is the substance of things hoped for hoped for the writer of hebrews declares right it is the evidence of things not seen you look at that word evidence there. It's a very interesting word. Not only a legal term, the evidence of things. So you're like, well, where's the evidence? It's also the word confidence. Let's replace it with that. How about that? Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the confidence. See, this is where David goes. He has the confidence even though the enemy has him surrounded. It's like pounding on the door, swimming across the moat. He's like, no, confidence in the Lord, centered in the Lord. Centered in the Lord. Uh, last time, if you were with us, I, I, I made the comment that I truly believe that Psalm 20 should sort of be our national anthem. I, I really kind of love that. It should be our national anthem. And that comes from Spurgeon. Spurgeon really declares that. And I think if that's true, then Psalm 21 would be 
our Pledge of Allegiance. That's what David is declaring here in these verses. His Pledge of Allegiance. In not in any way allowing his heart to wander in losing the wonder. But there can be times in our lives where there is a disruption in the cadence. Like you just were going in for a regular checkup and all of a sudden the report comes back in some things that you were not in any way expecting. And maybe your wife ends up spending five days in the hospital. You can kind of like pull the rug out. You tune on the news and it's this and it's that and it's the other thing. And it, 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 it does. For, for me and for you, for all of us, facing different things. And, and it, it causes us to pause. This psalm causes us to pause and say, who truly is the center of it? And, and where, where is my faith residing and, and, and resting? But it's a chance to just sort of like reflect and adjust if necessary. And come back to the very confidence of the things, even things not seen. I love that line from one of the characters in Narnia where he says, he says, he says we were talking about last night, where he, where he says, I, I am with Aslan even if Aslan isn't here. I'm a part of Narnia even if Narnia doesn't exist. He's like, I'm all, that, that, that is you and I having a faith in the substance of things, still hope for, this is faith, hope, and, 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 and love and, and, and the assurances of it all to the extent that he becomes the center of our absolute entire existence. Guys, don't compartmentalize it. Don't silo this thing off and say, well, I've checked the box and gone to church. In allowing the mystery of faith to somehow become diluted and dissolved in all the other things that we can end up finding ourselves living for. No, allow work to become your worship. Allow church to be as much of your Monday as it is your Sunday. And the raising of your kids and family and that it all revolves and centers around him. There's an amazing theologian named David Wells. David Wells um, is at uh, Gordon-Conwell outside of Boston, but he was born in Zimbabwe. David Wells, some of you think in the picture. Uh, not that David Wells. That guy went to Point Loma High School, grew up in Ocean Beach, pitched for the Toronto Blue Jays, went to the New York Yankees, got a perfect game for them, right? Remember that guy? Love that guy. Not that guy. Uh, David Wells, the theologian from Zimbabwe, said, now listen to this. Just, just soak this one in. Snap a pic of it if you have to. Show it with your kids. I mean, we begin as if life were empty, Here's what he says. This is genius. This is San Diego. This is a lot of people. We begin as if life were empty and without center. And as if we were empowered by our choices to make life what we will. Hello, I got some young people in the room right now that are like, yeah? No. Not yeah, no. No. No, well, we begin as life is empty, you know, and there's like a blank slate and just like this open piece of canvas and we're just sort of like empowered by our choices to make life what we will. What? And so we create our own center. And we create our own rules. And we make our own meaning. All of which springs from an alternative center in the universe, ourselves. David's pushing back on that thought in Psalm 21. He's saying, no, 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 church, come back with me in allowing him to be the center. Now, here's the mistake that we make. Just because God calls you the apple of his eye, and he does, incidentally, in the Psalms. Just because God declares, I love the world so much, I gave my only begotten son for you. In other words, I've made you the center of my universe. This is God saying, I have made you the apple of my. Just because he's made you the center doesn't mean you make you the center. It means you make him the center. That's what Wells is getting at. Timothy Willard, who was a 
C.S. Lewis scholar living in North Carolina wrote a book called Veneer. What a title. Veneer. Veneer. Subtitle, Living Deeply in a Surface Society. Isn't that great? That's what these guys are getting at. The recapturing of the wonder of the divine. Don't tolerate for another moment in your existence allowing yourself to be at the center. Come back to having a faith and confidence that's in him, the substance of things hoped for. Everyone else, I get it, in these parts is living for what you can see. Church, we should be standing out together as the ones that are living for things we can't see because the things we can't see are the things that are eternal. The rest is rubbish. Where's your faith? What's your faith resting in these days? Because when those disciples saw him die, they lost their faith. They lost their confidence. And they needed the evidence of the empty grave to get it back. We're we're now living on the other side of Easter. So the question then begging to be asked is simply this what are you confident about what are you trusting in and how is it that Moses in his meeting with God at the burning bush isn't confident in anything not a confident in himself not confident in God's plan he's looking for any type of a leak or loophole to get out of it he's blaming it on his stuttering and yet when it's all said and done he's in his faith is, is, is stirred, and he becomes confident, confident in even going back to Egypt where he's wanted for murder, confident in the evidence to which now has been presented to him by the glorious God that David draws our attention to in Psalm chapter 21. And he goes, he goes, and he meets... Turn to Exodus with me just for a second. Exodus chapter 7. I think this is absolutely amazing and worthy of our time because it's been so gutted by Hollywood. He goes to Pharaoh with this, with this newfound faith and this confidence and this evidence that, that, that Hebrews is speaking of, right? And he goes down, and here's what Hollywood wants to say. You've seen the movie, right? He stands before him and he says, let my people go. That is not what he says. It's not what he says. You're like, I thought that's what he said because you bought the movie. (laughs) Drank the Kool-Aid. What's he say? Here's what he says. The Lord God of the Hebrews has sent me to you saying, and and it says it every time. Church, please, just here to help. I'm on the edge with you. It's like wondering where this whole world is headed, where it's going to go. And and I want us to be the ones today that are so secure in our faith. I get letters. People are like, you're too close to the edge. I am on the edge. (laughs) So are you. But you got to have a faith that he's going to catch you. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. He's, He's got you. Stop being so freaked out and fearful to fall into his arms. He's going to catch you. He's got you. And don't let the world gut the power of Moses' faith out of the narrative. He says this, let my people go so that, that's not like a period, it's a comma, so that they may worship me. The whole point of the freedom is worship. If you don't get that, you're going to think that the end goal is freedom. And freedom is never an end in itself. It is a means to an end. In fact, the freedom that a lot of kids ultimately end up receiving is why there is a generational miss in the church right now between ages 18 and 29. Why? Because they got a little freedom. And now they're MIA. Because they thought the freedom was an end in itself. So Hollywood wants to take that and say, no, Moses declares, let my people go. He never says, just let my people go. He says, let my people go so that they may worship. Now, worship wasn't a problem in Egypt. They worshiped everything. Everything that moved was being worshipped. He's like, 
what? You've got plenty of things to worship here. He's like, no, we're going out to worship the Lord, to make him the center of our lives. In fact, he says it again. Look at chapter 8. Chapter 8, verse 1. Thus says the Lord, let my people go that they may serve me. Same word, worship me, that they may come out of this mess and praise me, serve me, worship me. Next plague that comes, lice. Lice gets no warning. If you don't know that, you don't have kids. There's no warning for lice. Ask Michelle Chapman. She runs our preschool. So there's no warning for the lice in chapter 8, but there becomes a warning here for the flies. Look at verse 20. Verse 20, then he comes to Pharaoh again and says, let my people go. No warning for the lice. Lice gets no warning. The flies get a warning. Let them go that they may worship me. The whole point is worship. What are you worshiping? What's your faith in right now? Where's the wonder? Listen, wonder is the result of what you stay focused on. Oh, well, I'm focused on the elections in November. Shut (laughs) the back door. (laughs) Sorry. Uh, What a hopeless strategy to put your faith in men put your faith in the lord put your trust in the lord some miraculous things that are happening in the ukraine right now we have 22 churches there that are associated with horizon slash calvary chapel throughout ukraine there's some miraculous things that are happening right now at the hand of almighty god This is a David and Goliath scenario. We prayed last night and stuck around well after the service was over and just asking the Lord to bring a spirit of hesitation upon the ranks of the Russian soldiers. Like, what are we doing with our own brothers and cousins that it would all backfire big time? As it does with Pharaoh, I mean, over and over again, the flies get the warning that they may go and serve me. Chapter 9, that they may go and serve me, verse 1. Chapter 9, verse 13, that they may go to serve me. How is it we have allowed the world to remove the reason and purpose of the freedom? And if you remove the reason and purpose of the freedom, you end up with a bunch of people at the base of Mount Sinai not knowing what to do with their freedom so that they end up inventing and creating their own God made out of their own gold. You get the point. Where's your faith? What is our faith grounded and truly resting upon? And it may forever and now be said that it is resting upon the firm foundation of Christ and Christ alone church that's where it has to be elizabeth elliott i mentioned to you her her story last weekend here's probably my favorite quote that she gives elizabeth elliott says if your faith is resting in the idea look at look at this thought with me come on if your faith is resting in the idea of how god is supposed to answer your prayers this is a very shaky faith that is very shaky and it's bound to be demolished when the storms of life hit it But if it rests on the character of him who is the eternal I am, and that kind of faith is going to endure. This coming from a gal whose husband at 28 years old dies from a spear as he goes to Ecuador as a missionary. She's like, she's like, okay, let's talk about faith. In the context of that, that it needs to be grounded and, and, and assurantly resting upon the eternal I am, which incidentally is what Moses asked me. He's like, well, I'm going down there. It would probably be helpful if I could tell him who sent me. Tell him the great I am. Moses is like, I, I'm in. I got my, my faith is, is all in you. You are, the, you are the, the center of it all. A faith to stand before Pharaoh. Some of us right now have some Pharaohs in our lives. Because you've got a Pharaoh in your life. 
and a faith to stand like Moses stands before Pharaoh again and again and again and again, and he never goes off script. He just keeps the main thing, the main thing, this is it, that's all, that's enough. It's faith that he's going to set us free so that we can make him the center of our life, both, both, both now and for eternity, a confidence before whatever pandemic might be coming down the pike next, because this is just the start of all that. A, a, a belief in a land before the land is beheld, that he has gone to prepare a place for you in heaven. Lewis puts it this way. Lewis says this. I love C.S. Lewis. says, the continual looking forward to the eternal world is not some form of escapism or wishful thinking, but it's actually one of the things that Christians are meant to do. This is where we should be fixated upon. It's where our faith rests and our confidence lies. I get asked a number of times, I'm involved in law enforcement, and they'll say, can you come and pray at this memorial or at this, um, you know, we got to go and knock on the door of a, agent that's gone down or can you dedicate a building when the new field office was dedicated for the bureau here at 805 and the 5 they asked me to come and dedicate it and pray for it I was just asked to go up to LA because the the chaplain up there is in COVID protocol and and they're like but if you come and if you pray just don't use Jesus okay could you pray but not mention Jesus like politically, this has now become the thing, both in all law enforcement as well as military. You know, you just sort of like become, you know, somewhat of this. And I'm like, if I, hey, if I can't pray in the name of Jesus, I'm not coming. And I didn't go. I didn't go. I'm not going to go. Because you, you need to know something this morning. The power isn't in praying. The power is in who you're praying to. Your love today isn't a love for the church. Your love is for the one who's coming back for the church. Your love isn't in the song. Some of you, you're like, well, I don't really like to go into really because I don't like the song. It's not about the song. It's about the one we're singing to. And and I I see this whole agenda of people that want to gut that out of us to the extent that some of us are like, well, I'm, I'm okay with that. Elizabeth Elliot is saying, don't be okay with that. Lewis is saying, don't don't lose the wonder of it all. Where is your faith? Because ultimately, that is going to answer where your hope lies. Faith, hope, and love. Hope, here, hope. Dave, here, in Psalm 21, hangs all of his hopes on one peg. He puts all of them hinged on one door. Christ and Christless, very messianic, prophetic picture of Jesus, the coming king, that this king here in Psalm 21 is now bowing down to. It's a very messianic song. It's all about the hope that we have when our lives are centered and positioned in Christ. That's why Peter, who learns the hard way, that's why so many of us, including me, relate with him so well. He seems to finally come around to the point, but it takes him a while, and ultimately he comes around to the point of declaring this, and Peter says this, Peter declares, he says, sanctify the Lord. What does that mean? It means set him apart. It means don't let it get all mixed up and diluted down with everything else that's running around in this crazy age of information and knowledge. Sanctify him in your hearts. Set him apart. Sanctify him in your hearts. And always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks for the reason of the hope that is in you. They're like, how do you hope right now? This thing easily could spill into Poland, into Romania, and and into Europe, and what's Germany going to do, and what about this, and what about that, and the UN is now saying over 4 million refugees escaping out of Ukraine. Where's your hope? Where's your hope lie? Where's your hope rest? And and I'm, I'm praying even as we would approach Psalm 23 together, that you would just have a bunch of folks just burning on your heart that you're going to invite to be a part of that four-week series. Because there's a lot of people who don't know God, but they love Psalm 23. And they need to meet its author. 
They need to allow him to become their good shepherd. They need a parallel life where, where, where you're just tracking with him. You're, you're in sync. You're in step. And you have this hope and people are asking you about it. But, it, but, but the response is not as some criminal defense attorney. It's in meekness and in fear. You don't need to be a lawyer. Someone said recently, God doesn't need lawyers, he needs lovers. Which is a great point. My son-in-law happens to be a lawyer. But what I love about my son-in-law is he's more of a lover than he is a lawyer. This is about all just letting people know where, where, where your hope is. And you're like, I don't know, Bob. I'm just like really trying. I'm doing my best to track with you. I'm here. I'm tuning in online. But I don't know. I just sort of feel like, and there's a verse about that, right? It says in Proverbs, hope deferred makes the heart sick. And there's some people that are like losing hope right now. They've lost the wonder of it all. They're wondering even as they would ask Peter, where is this return of the Lord? You Calvary Chapel guys have been telling me since the 70s. Well, he's not slack concerning his return. He's long-suffering, not wanting any to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. You see, that's what he's talking about, but a hope deferred. And this bugs me, this, this, this idea that deferred means delayed. People are like, it's delayed. Like, when's he coming? You know, Maranatha, come quickly. Lord, come now. We pray that all the time. I was out to dinner with Stuart and Jill Briscoe, and I said, Lord Jesus, come quickly. And Stuart looked me across the table and said, don't pray that. And I'm like, I pray that every day. He's like, I got too many unsaved family members and unsaved friends who need Jesus. Right? How many people have come to Christ since 1980? Let me see your hands. You came to Christ since 19... Because we were all praying in the 70s, Lord, come quickly. You're pretty happy that he didn't. <laughs> you have to have a hope that his return is perfectly timed. And that we simply get to be a part of this process of cheering one another on. What if instead of hope deferred, deferred meaning delayed, deferred actually shows up 36 times in the Old Testament. What if it actually meant this? Because it does... Over 26 of the 36 times that it's used, it doesn't mean delayed, it means drawn away. So if George and Betsy's hope gets drawn away, I have no problem concluding that their heart is now sick. But we are all in a waiting and holding pattern of this feeling of deferred that we're asking Lord, when? When? Disciples ask him, when? And he's like, only my father knows. The angels don't even know. Listen, win the weight. Don't lose the weight. Win the weight. Win the weight because you're your, your faith is resting in him. Your, 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 your hope is resting in him. Even when you're getting crapped on. Even when you're getting dumped. I've been to Africa like a half a dozen times. Here's my favorite picture. Here it is, the shot right there. That is, that is, that is, that is mommy elephant. And don't try and convince me for a second that this is random because I asked my guide. I've been there like six times. I'm like, does this happen often? He's like, all the time. <laughs> does she not know that baby elephant is behind her when she is about to drop load? Can you in the back see? Because the ones in the front are wishing they were further away. <laughs> Give me the side shot. Here's the side shot. This is when Dumbo becomes Dungbo. <laughs> boom, boom, um, what's going on here? What the stinking heck? You know what this is? This is a picture I should never be shown in church. Okay, come on. You know what this is? This is protection from predators. And mama knows that this actually ends up making baby elephant a much stinkier meal <laughs> for the predators.
the next time you're feeling <laughs> it just could be the Lord <laughs> protecting you Protect, I'm serious about this, protecting you. Like, I'm sorry you got divorced. I, I truly am with all my heart. God hates divorce. But if you got saved because you got dumped and you met Christ because that other God let you down, I'm, I'm, I'm truly... Sorry, but he works in mysterious ways. And you just might have gotten saved with your name in heaven because of the crap dump of that divorce. And I'm telling you right now, you won. You won. I'm sorry about the bankruptcy. The bankruptcy stinks. The bankruptcy was horrible. But it just could have been the Lord protecting you from worshiping the God of money the rest of your life. So you got to, what, 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 you know what this is? This picture, this elephant picture is a picture of love. Of protective love. Faith, hope, and love. Church, this is what we have at our disposal. This is what matters. That's it. That's all. That's enough. That's all that remains. And the greatest of these is love. I love this. We're told that the love of God has been poured out upon us. The love of God has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. See, into our hearts, the verse declares, that the love of God has been poured out into our hearts. Because a lot of us want to just make it this intellectual thing, this conceptual thing up here, but the Psalms helps us to realize it's been poured into our hearts. Because otherwise you could just sort of keep it like as a formula and miss the fellowship. Well, you know, it says that God so loved the world that he gave his, and I'm in the world, so I guess he loves me. And you just like miss the whole point of the genuine intimacy of a relationship based in love that he wants you to know and have and enjoy that's growing every day. Don't miss the whole deal. It's all about his love being poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. That's the good courage. Be strong and of good courage in your faith. Be strong and of good courage in your hope. Be strong and of good courage in his love. I think probably the, the darkest of the seven books in the Narnia series the darkest one has to be the silver chair because everyone's thinking the silver chair is sort of like the hope and the goal and the and 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 and, and, and the reason for the story it's not the chair the chair's the problem it's the darkest of all the stories the whole thing happens underground and here he's just like at this, I mean, the giants are above ground. Everything else is below ground. And, and here's Lewis. is just like amazing ability to both speak to kids and the enjoyment of the story. But at a deeper level, as parents are reading it, they're just like blown away. They're just like, whoa. And the whole point of the silver chair is for us to know who our enemy is. And you got this green lady who keeps showing up. The green lady. And the green lady is a monster. Sorry, gals. She's a monster. She's a snake. And she's got really inbound in the silver chair. And a lot of us right now, even though we're in church, we are bound to a lot of things that happened in our past. We're bound to a lot of our own fears. We're bound to a lot of our own limitations, just like Moses was when he is standing before God at the burning bush. It's not the chair that society wants to place you in. It's not the zip code that you live in. It's not the square footage of your house. Those are all of the things that ultimately get smashed as Rillian is set free from this chair that he is sitting in. The chair is zapping him from the reality of who he really is and ultimately turning him into a slave. And success can even be a slave. And so ultimately, what is drawn out but a sword? And a sword destroys the chair. And the sword, I'm telling you, both in C.S. Lewis's mind as well as in Scripture itself, is the Word of God. 
The sword of the Spirit is greater than the chair. It smashes the chair and all that this world, according to Paul, wants to squeeze and mold us into, according to Romans chapter 12. Finally, Rillian is released from the bondage of being who he's not and set free to be who he is. And who is he? He's the prince. He's the son of King Caspian. No longer is he bound. He is, he is ultimately set free. It's not, it's not the chair. It's the sword. It's not the church. It's the one who's coming for the church. It's exactly the point when Jesus meets with the disciples and says, so who's everybody saying I am? Just kind of curious. What are they saying? Well, some say you're a teacher, and he was a great teacher. Is that all he is for you? Well, others are saying you're a prophet, and he was a prophet. He was a great prophet. But ultimately, it comes down front and center to Jesus looking at Peter saying, who do you say that I am? You're going to be bound in some societal chair? And reflect what everyone else wants you to be and live for. He says you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And the sword smashes the chair. And Jesus declares to Peter, flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, Peter. You didn't come up with this on your own. But my father who is in heaven. It's like, man, great day for Peter, right? Wrong. What's the next thing that happens? He has to sit Peter down. I mean, right immediately after this wonderful event and he calls him Satan. He says, get behind me, Satan. That's us thinking we can sort of devise and come up with things on our own. And he's like, no, no, no. You just need to be spirit-led and trust with the plan and go with faith, hope, and love. Otherwise, you're batting for the other team. You're calling the balls and strikes. You think you're the umpire. You're not the umpire. I'm not the umpire. I'm not even the manager. Yes, the board. Who's the senior pastor of this church? They're not going to respond and say, Bob Botsford, it's Jesus Christ. He's not looking to be replaced. If anything, I'm the caddy. I'm just carrying the clubs. I'm not the umpire calling balls and strikes. I'm not the owner. He's the owner. I'm not the manager. He's the manager. If anything... I think I'm the third base coach. I'm just pointing people home. I'm just pointing people home. I'm just saying, go home. Come on. Go home. You remember this guy? This guy was crazy, man. This guy was hilarious in the last World Series. Third base coach for the Atlanta Braves. And uh, I just want to be that in your life. I just want to be like pointing you home, church. And, and if trouble's on a ride, just kind of want to say, stop, 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 stop. Okay, come on, let's go. <laughs> slide. Some of you just like getting into heaven, you're just going to be like sliding across <laughs> home day. <sighs> and the Lord's going to say, you're safe. You're in your home. You've made it. <laughs> you know, when, when uh, Caspian dies, his body is floating down the river there in, in that scene. and I remember Dave and I, we were in northern Thailand. Willie was with us. I took Mitch at one point. You got Laos there. You got Burma. And you got this Mekong River. And it's not very random to see a body floating down that river, people that were trying to get out of China. And here you have, Prince, you have King Caspian's bodies floating down this river. And Aslan says to Eustace, I want you to pick one of the thorns from that bush on the bank and pierce my paw. And Eustace says, no, I don't want to do this. See, God wants to use us with his plans and purposes. He says, I don't want to do that. And and Aslan says, do it. And he pulls this big thorn out of the bush and he stabs it in Aslan's paw and blood begins to flow into the river. And the moment the blood touches King Caspian, he's revived comes back to life, but not as some old old guy. He comes back to life as this young kid. Lord, in a week that has been 
riddled with bullets and missiles, a world that is now at war, the loss and the death and the pain. We want to be found as the ones who put our faith and our hope and our love in you, for you make all things new. And we pray that you would, even right now in this room, make all things new. May hearts turn to you. May, may faith be settled. in this place. May hope be restored. May love prevail. May your light shine through the darkness of these days in which we live. May may we stand out and somehow, Lord, help us as a nation to return and once again become the city on a hill. For in this hour and at this very moment, the world is longing for some heroic leaders who's going to step up, who's going to be bold and speak truth, who's going to protect and who's going to provide and and who's going to deliver. Let this nation turn to you. Let our hearts turn to you. Let what the enemy is meaning for evil in the world be turned around and used for evangelism. Strengthen pastors and churches and marriages and families that are in harm's way even as we pray we bow before your throne of grace and lift up the nation of ukraine and poland and romania and families that have now become separated pray that you would strengthen the church that is there in that place that you would provide your supernatural protection and that you would use this hour and the things that the enemy is meaning to divide and discourage and defeat lord we declare the victory is found in the name of Jesus, the name above all names, the name that is worthy of our praise, both now and forever. Church, are you with me? Come on, let's stand and let's give him our praise. Sing it together.